Hey guys, welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. I'm your host, Bessel Zazili, NBA player turned podcast host. And on this show, I'm going to have a lot of my inspiring friends come on to share with you their rebuilding journeys. I hope you can take the tips from their lives and apply it to your life as well. Oh, and don't forget to hit subscribe, like, comment, share with a friend. Uh, yeah, all the things. All right, I'll see you guys soon. Chloe Arnold, welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. Thank you for having me, this Festus. Been a long time coming too, by the way. I know. Okay, so can I do the the awkward thing now and do list whatever. off all the? I don't know how much time we have for me to list off all <laughs> your accolades. Oh boy! You're an American dancer, Emmy nominated choreographer, director, actress, producer. Am I missing anything? Um, well, dancer. I mean, like like tap dancer, dancer of all genres. Yeah. Yes. That's what, yeah. I mean, that was... Okay. You're best known internationally as a tap dancer. Yes. And recently, you were seen on season 11 of Foxes, So You Think You Can Dance. Relatively recently. <laughs> With your company, The Syncopated Ladies. Mm-hmm. Chloe Arnold's Syncopated Ladies. Yes. How are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um... I have so much that I want to ask you about your life and how you came to be. But first, how are you doing today? I am great. I just came from rehearsal with Syncopated Ladies. We are in the midst of massive productions and shows. We're going on tour again. So today was really fun because it was the first day rebuilding our tour because we did a tour in the in the spring and now we're doing a fall winter tour so i feel excited you know it was like a great kickoff all the vibes were on and honestly just dancing is is joy how do you even get to choosing tap dance how does dance come into your life i know you started really young why don't you tell the story well i was i was born and raised in dc and my mom was a dancer she wasn't a professional dancer but dance was part of her life and spirit and so she thought, you know, let me introduce my daughter to the love for dance. So we went to like a, a pretty kind of basic dance studio that was like in a strip mall, one studio. You went in, you took ballet, tap, jazz. And through that program, I realized that I really just had a natural love for tap. And in actuality, what really happened is I had a tap duo with, a, with like my friend back then. And um, it wasn't that good. And I remember my mom saying, like, Ugh, that's not that great. Like, because my mom is very honest. She's not a coddler. She's not like, you're the best ever because you're my daughter. She's just like <laughs> straight up. So she was like, that's not that great. I think you girls need to work on it. And I think you should revamp it if it needs revamping. Be, like, put some more in. Like, give, give it something. So it was kind of my first time choreographing something. I was about eight years old mm. where she challenged us to she left us to our own devices to just go and and infuse more passion into it i think maybe the choreographer maybe phoned it in a little bit and my mom wanted us to to level up on our own so that's what happened and then i lo i loved it so much and my mom realized maybe tap dance is her thing so she started to look for more opportunities and those opportunities came from outreach programs that these incredible tap masters like Gregory Hines, the Nicholas Brothers, were doing in D.C. And so I got to go take master classes from them. Wow. And so at nine and ten years old, well, at nine years old, I saw the movie Tap, and I was like, that's what I want to do. And then at ten years old, I got to actually take class from a lot of the people in the movie. So that was the, really the what made it go from fantasy of like, that's so incredible, to then real life, this is actually possible, these people are doing it. Okay, so we're gonna even get into, because since then, you've turned it into a whole business, you have <laughs> your own company, you are world renowned now, but you start your first modeling job at four, <laughs> you started dancing at six, mm -hmm. you were on TV for the first time at 12. Mm. You also played the violin, got a scholarship and awards in school, how was your childhood? Was oh it a busy and challenging one? It sounds challenging. Yeah. So my childhood, you know, there are many ways to reflect on it, right? Like when I look at my childhood from right now, I feel so thankful. I feel like, oh my God, I loved being a kid. 
I loved life. And I think I was telling you this. I'm a participator. I, I learned. That. I love to participate. If someone's like, who wants to? I'm raising my hand. I don't even need to know what we're doing. I want to do it. Whether that's academic, whether that's in sports, in dance, you know, socially, I really love participating. So there were two parts of my life. The, the most challenging part of my life was growing up not having the financial means to do everything that we wanted, right? So, you know, the reality of my childhood is that we struggled to pay rent. We struggled to keep the lights on. We struggled to, you know, just survive. So the fundamental survival part was very, very challenging. But that's what made life so incredible. And I think that a lot of people can relate is that you make something from nothing, right? So you take the little you have and you figure out how to maximize it. So my mom was keen on finding every free program that existed. So there was an incredible DC Youth Orchestra. They gave you instruments. You got free lessons. Boom. I was in that program playing violin. Um, I was part of the rec center. I played soccer. I went to the basketball court every day. Yeah? From... I'd say nine to maybe 14, I play basketball almost every day. That's some game? Yeah, you know, I say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll Participator see you on the court. Life. <laughs> um, I played football in, like, in middle school. I was on the intramural football team. I, wow. Yeah, like I was class president in high school because I loved being able to help my classmates. I was always like into anti-bullying, so I was like a peer mediator because I was pretty popular. So I thought, how can I use this to help people's lives be better? You know, in 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 a city where people will give you a hard time if you don't stand up for yourself, right? And so I think when I look at DC as a kid, you know, it was the murder capital of the world. There was so much violence. You know, I had friends that were murdered so young. Um, so for me, the participation was how I found joy in what was a city of under siege, what was, a, what was a life of challenge and difficulty. It was raised by a single mom. I was able to say, well, you know what? I don't have time for that mess because I'm over here doing something that fulfills yeah. me. So I think my, what was amazing is that my mom, again, just didn't let anything stop us. Right. She really was like, whatever you imagine, whatever you dream, you can achieve. And that was the ever present thought in my household, period. I love that. Yeah. But was she an artist herself? No, she was a school teacher. Okay. So I think that's, you know, I mean, teacher, school teachers are the greatest to help you see that in yourself that you didn't know was in you. Right. That's the, the purpose of a teacher is to help you unlock something within. And so I think she was really great at doing that for us because she knew the pitfalls of when it, when you make when you're not active when you're not participating she really understood what happens to students because she was witnessing it firsthand as a teacher and she would always put in extra time to help people find another way so i don't mind as a devil's workshop boom <laughs> for us even for me as a kid having sports to keep me busy taught me discipline taught me all the things leadership but Yes, it also keeps you busy. You, know, yes. you don't have time. You're too tired at the end of the day to go Way get in trouble tired. sometimes. <laughs> Way too tired. There's this thing. It's called Wunderkinder. It's where young adults and kids who have had high success at a young age, that they're more forced by parents. Rather than enjoying the thing that they do, they're forced into those things. Was that a part of your story? Not at all. When I, it's actually the opposite of my story. My mom, you know, she, she kind of made like a menu, right? Here are, the, here are the possibilities. And then I selected from the menu and I said, okay, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. But I'll tell you, there's what's, well, what's amazing, and I think this, again, deals with growing up in poverty, is my mom couldn't be that. She couldn't be like, standing over me, watching my every move, making sure I made the right decisions. She actually had to fully trust me. And when I say fully, fully. From about 12 years old, I was already on the subway and bus taking myself to dance. Like I, I had to want it. 
because I had to get there physically myself. I had to be in the space and know what I needed and make sure I brought what I needed. And if I needed food, make sure I'm cooking for my sister and I. And, you know, we were very independent children, very young. My sister had a job, my sister Maud, she had a job at eight years old, sweeping up the hair at a barbershop on the corner from our, where we grew up. I worked at the junkyard across the street from where I grew up. So, and literally when I say junkyard, I mean junk yard. Doing what? So I, w I walked in one day to like the kind of disheveled office and it looked messy. And I said, do you need some help? I can help you organize. And the guy, I think he just honestly wanted to help, out, uh, help a sister out. And I was probably about 13, 14. And he was like, sure. And so I would go and just clean up put papers together. I mean, honestly, I don't know exactly how he was making money because he was just selling parts, like random junk parts. But it was an amazing thing because I worked there. I worked at the mall. I cleaned um, the apartment building that we grew up in along with my family. We, we mopped and we also cleaned um, like newly new vacancies to help reduce our rent. I mean, we really had to teamwork, dream work. So it was never... The fact that my mom actually was so cool with us taking these adventures towards our dreams was really amazing because we did have to also make sure we were all, all working towards survival, right? And so my mom is truly amazing because when I was in seventh grade, I got into the gifted and talented magnet school. And it was in a different neighborhood with different kids. And I had, you know, I had my friend base in my track of public school. And so my mom was like, look, you have to go try. You can't just say, I don't want to go to that school. You don't know the school. You got to go try. So I go to the school. I'm there for about two weeks. I'm like, mom, I hate it. I don't like the vibe. There's, it's not artistic. There's not enough sports. Like I was, you know, I was just not feeling it. And she said, if you really, really want to go back to your, what some may call regular school, by all means, you can go, but you have to make the decision and you have to be comfortable with that decision. And so uh, long story short, I ended up going back to my school with all of my friends and the track that I was on. And I'm so thankful for my mom allowing me to, to see something from my life that worked better because it's very rare that any parent will let their kid leave a magnet program to go back to you know regular matricul matriculation public school because they say they don't like it. But when you came back though, you, you, now you know that you're gifted and talented because that's the name of the school you just came from. Now you're like, okay, I know what I am. I know. I, I'm not gonna lie. I always, I've, I found some diaries from when I was a kid and from like seven, eight years old in my diaries, like in capital letters, it says, I am awesome. I was doing affirmations from very young. Wow. Yeah, and, and it wavered in that puberty age where like the world tries to get you, you know, and like shake your spirit. But my early years were really like fortified by like this, this self-love concept. And I don't know who, I think, I think again, my, my parents both always advocated for self-love. That is something that I think people need to hear, especially for parents, how much that support that your parents gave you or your mom gave you especially that is really important for kids in those formative years especially yes. right yes. understand that you can do these things you can yes. do great things now become a tap dancer that's is this normal is this common in dc <laughs> because i know you said you saw gregory hines rest mm -hmm. in peace by the way yes and you know debbie allen comes into your life what is what was it about tap dancing that drew you was it something about yeah, so tap is unique because it's music and dance. Mm. So you are a musician, and when I say you are a musician, you are really a musician. You have to be a skilled musician, which is why playing the violin, I play clarinet, was really helpful because I understood music. And then dance is just the greatest, for me, form of how you can move your body. So I loved music and dance so much, and I think that tap is just like the absolute synergy of that but no is it common absolutely not um i think that every kid across america when they go into dance program they do take tap it is part of the like fundamental 
Everybody takes it. No way. Mm-hmm. So the other day when I came up to your studio and you taught me that I'm building my foundation by yes. doing tap. Dance. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's like standard. It's the standard thing. But what happens is that due to, okay, let me try to explain this, this the history relatively briefly. So the art of tap dance is an original African-American art form born in America during the um, period where Africans were enslaved in America. So they're coming with their music, their dance, and being a tool of communication, expression, survival, etc. And the art of tap evolved out of that. the, The rhythm was so poignant, the rhythm of our people was so poignant that in North Carolina in the 1800s, they banned the drum they banned black people from using a drum mm. because the, the power and significance of rhythm was so, per, so pervasive in creating freedom. So when I think of tap dance, I think of it as a freedom language, right? Now, the first superstars in America were tap dancers. Bill Bojangles Robinson was the black man who was one of the first black millionaires in America. He was a star on Broadway and in movies which is unreal, right? He also was an activist because he, ref- he was so famous that he was able to refuse to wear blackface on screen, therefore leading the way for black entertainers to no longer have to do that. So he was a true pioneer. And then you had um, like the first black woman to have a TV, a movie contract with MGM, Jenny Lagan, black woman, tap dancer. And then you have artists like Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly, the um, Nicholas Brothers. Now, so tap dance in the early 1900s was the art form. It was the hip hop of the early 1900s, as was jazz, right, as the music. So then you get to a period where in essence, which so often happens with black forms of art, where the, ma- where the white majority ends up falling in love with it, which is great. We want all our people, we want everyone to love what we're doing. But the voice and the empowerment component of being um, the, the executive producers of a show or owning the entity of the art starts to disappear. So you have artists like uh, the Nicholas Brothers who start in a movie but get no residual, have no royalty, didn't make a penny off of it, um, got cut out of theaters that were segregated. So their part of the movie would be cut out uh-huh. when played in the South, right? And so what ends up happening is the voice of black folks is getting erased. And as you're having black power movement, which is about self pride and self love, it's almost like the narrative gets flipped. And it's like tap dance is looked at as a time period where there's racism and segregation. So people want to separate themselves from it because they feel ashamed because it was a part of a time where they were being uh, well, we're always being discriminated against, but in such an overt and incredibly disrespectful way. So then you have this kind of lull where tap is no longer in the forefront, no longer in the in the spotlight. And there is a sense of, and not in all black people, but a little bit of shame that gets carried on. Because if you right. think about, think about how many times you might have heard people say, you know, don't tap dance around the situation. In actuality, it's really insulting. Because like you're saying that as though tap dance is um, trivial or, or, or is a disrespectful thing to do, right? And, and, but it all comes from self not appreciating an art form that was actually creating freedom, right? Because again, it's just how history is told or passed on. And so then you have an artist like Gregory Hines mm-hmm. who comes out of the fold of these incredible artists that came before But he's able to say, we're going to flip the narrative. We're going to reclaim this art form that comes from our history. And we're going to make us, we're going to make it so that we're proud to do this. And this is a badge of honor because I, because you understand what, what really went down. And then he was able to bring tap to the music of the time, which was funk music. So now he's got funk bands and he's playing and he's a, charismatic incredible performer and he becomes that person who's able to bridge the gap right and you see him starring on broadway you see him starring in movies and so he really 
and 30 years ago, that's 30 years ago, he made the movie Tap, and that was the re-explosion and the re-emergence of it in modern day. Now, we still are in a space <laughs> where we're working to create more awareness, more spotlight on the art form, and particularly the voice of the black woman has actually never been celebrated or been the leading voice or been the executive producer of, you know, the entity. And so that's... Enter, Chloe. Ta-da! Exactly. So for me, when I was, when I met Gregory Hines and saw the movie Tap, from then on, I, I would assert out loud, I'm going to become a tap dancer and I'm going to go to Harvard Law so I can be rich because then if I go to Harvard Law and I'm rich, then I can enjoy being a tap dancer. So I hadn't, at young, I hadn't understood that, you know. You make money from art. Exactly. I was just like, I'm going to have to do, go to Harvard because I need money. Because art is a hobby. Right. That can't be a job. That's what you were thinking at the time. Yeah, and I think I also just, I think it's just so hard when you don't have money to imagine how you make the leap. Because in my mind, I was like, I got to be rich. Like not just, you know, you know how it is. Like when you don't have a lot, you're looking to, I want a house. I want to have a backyard. I've never had a backyard. I want to have a car that doesn't break down. Um, that's new. What a thought, you know. So for me, I was thinking, I got to have all those things. So Harvard will get me those things, and then TAP will, will provide all the happiness and the joy. And um, I don't know if I told you this, but I got into Harvard. So I was going to ask you about that. So <laughs> you got into Harvard. So you and I kind of did the same thing. Okay. Because coming from Nigeria, Harvard is the top of the top. When you come to America as an immigrant, when I came here, like, you look at the top of the list. And there's Harvard, there's Yale, there's Princeton, there's all these different schools. You go to Stanford, all, all these schools that us as Nigerians, we hold academics to such a high standard mm -hmm. because your job is to make yourself as indispensable as you can. And so the, the idea is you got to get a job, be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. You know, that stereotype is a real thing for Nigerians and Africans mm -hmm. in general, but immigrants. Mm -hmm. But it's because you just want to do the things that you can. Make sure you work as hard as you can in school and get these jobs that are always needed. Right. So... When the idea came up for me to go to Harvard, because I, I got into Harvard, and okay, this is at this time though uh -huh. we're talking about art. Right. I started to fall in love with basketball, mm -hmm. and so I didn't want to go to a school where I was pigeonholed. So I still went to a good school, just like you did. I went to Vanderbilt. Right. You chose Columbia uh -huh. for your art. <laughs> Talk me through that decision making process, because for me in my Nigerian home, that's picking crazy. Another school other Ooh. than Harvard. See, listen, I hadn't seen my grandparents in eight years at the oh time. Oh my gosh. And my grandparents came to visit me. And the first question my grandpa asked me is, why didn't you go to Harvard? <laughs> 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 and yes. so this is, this is kind of the things that I deal with. But for you, this was a dream for you for yeah. your, that you had from being a kid. Yeah. I want to go to Harvard so I go to law school and be rich. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so you got into Harvard and you went to Columbia. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, it's still a great school. Right, of course. So first of all, you're the first person I've ever met that has the same story, really? which is amazing. <laughs> and I just that makes me so happy because when I hear you say it, um, it's, it, it's, it allows me to like step out and hear how it sounds when I t tell people that. Like, you did what? <laughs> like, how did you do that, right? So what made it a little extra crazy is that Harvard had given me full ride so i was also stepping into potentially not a full ride at columbia right but i remember there were a couple things that happened one um i had an english teacher who told me that i couldn't that i would never get into harvard i should look at some local schools and some state schools and that would be where i would be and i was like in my head i'm the type of person that all you gotta do is you say that to me i'm not gonna argue with you we're not gonna have a like you know, we're not gonna fight. I'm gonna look at you, and in my mind, I'm going to affirm what's gonna happen, and I'm just gonna get to work on it. Like, I have like that, I have the tiger, like, oh, you just said You oh, said that to me? Okay, bo boom, I got <sighs> you, I got you. And I think I share with you, my mom put a sign on my door on the inside of our apartment that said, what if Harvard were your safety school? So every day that we went to school, we went to school thinking the best Whoa. is gonna be Whoa. our safety. That's powerful. Yeah. 
This is your mom teaching you manifestation before yes. it's even a hot yeah, word like, a like it is now. Yep. And so in our humble apartment was this very powerful statement. And again, you know, what's also interesting is that, you know, when you have like a really nice house, it's very unlikely you're going to tape a poster to the front door. You know what I mean? Like someone living in a multi-million dollar home, it's beautiful. It's manicured. So like taking, my mom found that sign like on a bus stop. She pulled it down and put it in our house. So, you know, I think there's something very fascinating about like, even when you make it, make sure that- Take that freedom kind of. Yeah, and like that you don't make everything so manicured that it's not able to have like messages on the wall, let's say, right? I, I don't know, it's just a, a, something I think about because now I have a really nice house and I'm like, would I tape that yes, to my do. door? Yes, you do have a nice house. Thank you. It's a whole nother story for another day <laughs> about you. why you wouldn't let me stay in your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But um, when I, so I get into to Harvard and my mom, she, so what I didn't realize is that it was hard for her because to me, she made it totally up to me. I didn't know that it was actually her going, oh my, I wonder what's gonna happen, like whew, right? But that's what's so amazing about her. She's like, you know where you wanna be. So you gotta go where you wanna be. And I was like, I gotta be in New York City. It's the epicenter of dance, everything happening, oh. everything happening. And during that time, there were Broadway shows that I wanted to be in. There, that was like hip hop. You know, that's when Lauren Hill Outcast were, you know, performing, common, like the fervor of the city. I'm like, that's where I need to be, right? And I actually had done my Columbia College visit by myself at 15. I took the oh, wow. $20 bus up to New York alone, stayed at a homie's house. That was my friend from the dance. in New York? That was my friend from dance because he had gone on to Broadway. And wow, so he you knew somebody mm -hmm. already in the so okay yes so he was the bridge so I stayed with him and he took me to his Broadway show and I was like oh this is oh, it this is it right here I remember driving across the Brooklyn Bridge we were playing that song Lucini um, Camp Low it's a Camp Low song you might not even know it and like I'll never forget how I felt riding across the Brooklyn Bridge listening to hip hop and I was like this is where I gotta be so. Um, I ended up choosing Columbia, and I actually ended up getting the um, Bill Gates Millennium Scholarship, which covered the full tuition all four years. So it worked You're a out. Rock star. Thank you. <laughs> but are you scared making this decision? You know, it's interesting. I wasn't scared at all. Like my mom, in retrospect, she I think she was scared, um, and I just learned that like this year. I didn't even know that. Um, but for me, I was like, I know where I'm going. I got to dance. And at that point, that whole law, got to be rich law thing was now dissolved. I was like, I ain't going to law school. I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that. I want to dance. And so now I had another lens. Should we make that? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the, the key shift for me to not think I needed to be a lawyer was that when I was in high school I auditioned for a play with Debbie Allen okay it's important to say I auditioned for her twice I auditioned for her first when I was 14 and I didn't get it and I was devastated because I wanted to work with her at the Kennedy Center and Debbie Allen for us is the greatest of all time there's no black woman who has mastered the craft of dance and then translated it onto screen and been able to build an absolutely dynamic career that also serves the community. She's also the one of the queen of giving back. She's just the goat. And so she came to town. I didn't get it at 14 and I was like, okay, I gotta go back. I gotta go to the drawing board and I gotta train. I gotta train harder, I gotta know more. And so she came back when I was 16. Thank God she came back, did another play. And then when she came back to do, had a starring role for a female and male tap dancer. And I was like, that's my role, that's my role, I gotta get it. So I went to this audition, there were 800 kids, 800. 
and we is that number daunting very daunting i was petrified now that's when i was scared because those kids had more refined european training than me i had more raw rhythm you know i'm coming from like an all black dance studio where it's like sisterhood empowerment you know like we represented the culture and i'm coming in here and it's red carpet sprawling red carpets 100 foot ceilings you know girls stretching leg behind their head and i'm like oh boy i don't fit in here this is not i don't look like these girls um and i was wearing a shirt i had made i'll never forget it it said tap i made it it was at, at this like cool store in dc that was called the madness and it it said tapping for life the number four tapping for life and i went in i'm like yeah i got the outfit i'm ready <laughs> and then you come in and like everybody's in what much more formal clothing and i'm like oh, oh god like <laughs> is this the wrong look so anyway i actually snuck into the audition with my friend we snuck in early ahead of everyone and walked up to Miss Allen, which is totally insane, because she's very, very strong woman, right? She's either going to hug you or read you, depends on like how it goes. So we walk up to her and we say, Miss Allen, we're tap dancers. Whew. And she said, okay, well then show me something. And so she's like, go ahead and freestyle. So we freestyle and I'm feeling good about myself and we finish and she's like, very nice. Now go to the back of the line and put on your jazz shoes because you have to do like the whole, all the styles audition. So I go to the end of this line and I'm like, oh boy, because that's when n it's no longer my special skill. It's now the skill that everybody else seems to be better at than me in this line. But I remember my teacher, Miss Tony, and Miss Tony, she had a high pitched voice and she'd always be like, full out. <laughs> and full out means like, give it everything. Yeah, you go hard. Just, and, and her mantra was, the way you practice is the way you perform. So she was yeah. like, yeah, so she was like, you gotta just bring it. So I went in and I was like, I don't have the same technique as everyone else, meaning body type, extension of the leg, boom, 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 but I have fire. So I'm about to whip this hair, I'm about to give it sass, I'm gonna give it flavor, I'm gonna give it everything. And I ended up getting picked. And that shifted my belief system in the potential to be a successful artist because Debbie Allen was the living proof that you can start anywhere because she had similar upbringing to me. You can start anywhere and you can, uh, from something build everything, you know, from something small build everything. And so Debbie Allen is who introduced me to the thought, listen, you can be an a dancer and then within dance you can be a director a writer a producer a filmmaker she was like all of these things are within the same language and so my thought is i'm going to go to columbia and i'm going to study acting and that's thanks to debbie allen it's actually i actually really like that story for a couple of reasons one of them is you've seen two people now because you said there is a lull where tap dance is not really on the forefront. Mm -hmm. So you have a Gregory Hines mm -hmm. that comes in and shows you, and he plays this role of a guy who is playing a big part in the resurgence. Mm -hmm. And then now you have Debbie Allen. Now you see yourself yep. in another black woman. Yep. So continue the story. Eventually, okay, so. this, this, this idea, because Debbie Allen comes back into your life later. Yes. So here's what's incredible. I was in college. Um, and I've, you know, declared theater as my major, so I'm studying, I'm, I'm set to study acting. That's my thought. That's where I think I'm going. Well, there were a lot of other plans. So Debbie had a play going on in D.C. for adults that was like a professional one. People, you could get paid to do it. And, but I was in college, and I'm like, man, I want to be in that play, and I want to be in college. How, I don't know. How can I do this? So I took the bus back to D.C., and this is again before, you know, email, before social media. So I just roll up on the Kennedy Center and that's not normal. The Kennedy Center is this massive building with lots of security and like, and I snuck into her rehearsal that was already going on for a show she had already cast. Oh. And I was so scared. And I was like, God, I hope she doesn't, A, what if she doesn't remember who I am? 
B, what is it? Why are you here? Like nobody invited you. But you did it the first time. Yeah, I know. Out. But still, you know, it's still <laughs> scary. So I walk in and I'm like, "Hi, Miss Allen," and she's like, "Chloe, what are you doing here?" Wow. And I'm like, oh, "She knows my name." And I said, "I'm in college." She's like, "Yeah, I thought you were in school." Um, you know, and I said, "I am, but I wish I could be in this play." And she said, "Well, unfortunately, we've already cast it." And the rehearsal schedule is six days a week, and you know you got to go to school. You got to go handle that business. And I'm like, yeah, but I could be here on the weekend. And she was like, um, she was like, well, you know what? In the meantime, just go dance with them. Like, go over there in the corner, learn this dance, have fun, enjoy yourself today. So I go over, I learn one of the dances. We come back. She says, Chloe, did you learn it? Show me. So it's like a trio, and we show her, and she's like, wow, you. That was great. Wish you could be here, <laughs> but you can't. So I'm like, dang. So I said, but no, I really could be here. So here's what we could do. I'm like, I could come on the weekends. You don't have to pay me because there were no more slots. You don't have to pay me, and I could just be in that one number. So and I just rehearse on the weekend that one thing. And this is my proposal to her. And in amazing, you know, news, she says. You sure you want to do this without getting paid? And again, I had no money. We have to understand. I'm saying, don't pay me. I have no parents that can support me. I have very minimal jobs that are just keeping me eating in New York barely. And I was like, I'm gonna find that twenty dollars to get on this bus and come here every weekend. Passion, baby. Right. And so she said, okay, fine. You're crazy. Go for it. <laughs> so I start doing that. Within two weeks, there was a member of the cast who was acting out of pocket, doing some inappropriate things. Got he got fired, and then all of a sudden, the position opened up, and I got a role and a check. What is luck? <laughs> luck is preparation <laughs> meets yeah. opportunity. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you are taking all these steps, and people look at it like, "Wow, like you got lucky," but mm -mm. well, they missed you sneaking into the theater. Yes. Missed you already having this previous relationship with her from mm -hmm. the first time you tried out. Or right. actually, the f two times you right. tried out. Right, right. And you just keep taking these, these risks. Yes. Was it worth it? Oh, I mean, beyond. You? Beyond. Because then that show ended up having a run in Atlanta. So then I got to do my first, like, at it, like where they put you up in the hotel and they pay you per <laughs> diem. You have a weekly check and I was still in college. So this goes back to interestingly how my major ended up changing because I had to miss the first like two weeks of my uh, junior year. And my professor, the head of the department in acting, he was not very keen on people missing. So I ended up missing, missing like one day, let's say. It wasn't that much. Everyone else was cool with it because I explained what it was and they're like, yeah, go ahead and do that show. You can come like a week or two late to school. But the head of that department was very rigid. And I ended up getting to do the play, coming to school a little late, getting caught up, no problem. But this particular professor was just not down for my experiential learning. So I got my first like audition gig that I got in New York which was to go perform for Bill Gates' uh, annual meeting in Seattle. Was this because of his No, this is unrelated to me getting the scholarship. Wow. I got hired to perform for their company. So I tell my teacher I'm going to miss. And he's like, if you miss, I'm going to fail you. So, you know, you've already missed. You miss again. Three, three absences, you're done. So... I thought about it. I wrote him a very passionate letter trying to appeal to maybe the artist in him. And, but he was the department head, so there was no recourse beyond him. And he would have made my life miserable in the acting department. So I thought about it and I thought about Debbie again. And she had always said, if you can direct it, if you can create the work, then you rely on no one to cast you. You can create it for yourself. So I thought, Maybe I'll study film. So I go to the film school, check it out. I'm like, this looks like the right choice. So I switched my major to film. And that was the most important decision that I made that set, paved the way 
for what I've been able to do with tap dance. Because the only reason that people know the work that I do in tap is because my sister and I, my sister went to Columbia, studied film also, because we both had the skill set to create our own work. And when we created our own work, we were able to make we were able to make art to show the world how we imagine it from our voices, from our own lens, not subject to anyone else's opinion, quite frankly. And at that time, you had the onset of YouTube and boom, there was our platform to get our work out the way we imagined. You know what I didn't realize in the middle of all this while I was doing the research on you? I had actually seen your video. This is before we became friends. Oh my when God. When Beyonce shouted you out. Yes. And I was like, wow, that's crazy because the world is small. Oh my right? God. Um, over the course of your career, um, I just noticed you and the people you're around, but like these are genuine relationships. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the importance of relationships as you have continued to build this career of yours that has been amazing. Thank you. So um, when I moved to LA, so when I graduated school, Debbie Allen was like, you need to be in LA. I was like, all right. I mean, I don't, I mean, I was just going to struggle through New York and try to make it and see what happens. She told me I need to be in LA. I, I said, what date? <laughs> Had a bag and got on a plane and I'm in LA. And thanks to her, I got to live with her because I couldn't afford a place yet. And that period of time was so vital because I was now living with her, also going to her school and shadowing her on film sets, right? So one day, every day, every Monday, she let us use her dance studio for free to like jam out and practice. And one Monday night in particular, there were majority girls there. And that was rare because freestyle is typically in the, his in, the, in the history of dance, even in hip hop, in tap, the freestyle improv component has been dominated by men. So when I saw these girls, at an improv night, I said, ooh. And they were like 11, 14, 15. And I was like, do y'all want to be in a group? Literally. That was how it started. I was like, y'all want to be in a group? And they're like, sure. And I'm like, great. And I don't know what a group it looks like because I'm like 22. Mm. And so that was the beginning of Sync Ladies. And so it really started as a group of friends. And, and when I say friends, I definitely was the teacher. I'll say more like sister friend. Like I'm the big sister. Huh? And I've always been, like dance has always been a family. You know, it's like when I was growing up, my dance friends are my family. And I'm coming to Debbie's house, I'm living at her house, it's family. So dance has always been family. I relate to that very much. Right. Basketball as well. Are they, is everybody doing the same dance? Is everybody doing tap? Um, in sync the ladies. improv sync ladies, everybody was doing tap, but we all were training at Debbie Allen's in all styles of dance. So we all were taking African dance, hip hop, jazz, salsa, flamenco, ballet. Like we were, Debbie was very set on, you must be versatile. You must learn everything. And that I'm so thankful because that's, again, what has made my career far more successful because I have um, appreciation, understanding, and I know how to dance across the board. So, so the family part was how Sync Ladies was born. Just this like girlfriends, like we're here, hey, I'm the big sis, and like y'all want to do this fun. And then when we about ten years later, I actually had enough money to invest in making our own work, like the video that you saw that went viral. It depends on which one. There were two Beyonce ones that she shared. The one in 2013, End of Time, that one cost me $8,000 to make. Because this is, again, before iPhone, you know, before filmmaking became just cheaper because it was more accessible. So I had to rent a, a white psych. That's two grand. I got to get hair, makeup, wardrobe for everyone. Like, I need lighting. So I took my last pennies to make something for us that could maybe be just representative of the possibilities for what Investing we could do. Investing in your dreams. Yes. Important. Very important. And what was amazing is all the ladies were willing to do it and not get paid. Because that 8000 just covered production, not even any artist fee. And so that's what's incredible about the Sync Ladies and why I truly honor them. Because they invested their time and love into a belief 
that we could do this together. And it's so incredible because it's honestly never been done before. So they believed in something they'd never seen actually happen. They just had faith that my passion and my work ethic and my personal ethics could get us there. And they contributed their skill sets. You know, the ladies are smart. They're gifted. Asada went to UCLA, studies statistics. Anissa went to Oda School of Design as a fashion designer. Uh, Pam went to FIT. She can do Photoshop and edit, you know. And then, of course, my sister, who is my partner in all of this madness, because she's like, yeah, let's jump. Boom, let's do it, you know. And she always was like, any crazy idea I have, she's like, go get it. Any crazy idea she has, I'm like, let's do it. So the sisterhood and the family and the bond is, is the most important part. It actually is what makes all the hard work so rewarding is that at the end of the day, we're not just making money. We're not just, oh, we're popping. We actually love being around each other and we're sharing and putting out into the world a similar message together and separately because I think we have a unified like morals and values that everybody does it on their own in their own lives and then we come together and it's just like even more powerful. Have you ever had any setbacks in your career? Ooh. Moments that you thought yes. you weren't going to make it as part oh of being an gosh. artist. Yes. What made you keep going? What helped you? So to be, so in 2012, in 2012, um, when we started to put our work out and it started to get visibility, a lot of the friends that I thought, not my core friend group, like of the, the ladies, but some of the guys in my field who prior to were maybe my teachers or my role models, people I looked up to in the game, it's kind of like if you got to, if you were playing basketball and you and Kobe is, you know, like, go Festus, but then you win a championship and he's like, nah, he whacked. That's what happened to us. And it was devastating because all of a sudden, you know, I decades. Like on island. Yeah, decades of hard work. And then none of y'all like me anymore. Nothing changed except that other people like me too. <laughs> right? And it was a it was whew, it was so hurtful because like you said, I was now we, the ladies were on an island, and I had to ask them. I said, ladies, you're receiving the backlash of like, you're gonna get hated on because they're hating on me. It's gonna be tough. If you can't handle this, what's about to happen, I won't be upset if you need to bow out because it's, I, I can feel that this is getting, it's getting worse, not better. It's getting more intense. They're getting more hateful, more aggressive. So if it's too much, you know, let me know. Well, them in true fashion were like, nah, we got this. Because they're <laughs> tough girls, you know, everybody's from a city. They're tough, tough women. And uh, they were like, let's do it. And so once, once we kind of affirm, like, this is what we're doing, we don't care what they think. They can talk trash, they can say mean things, call us names, boom, 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 cyber bully, all the things. Try to blackball us, try to say, oh, if they're on the job, we won't come. Bet. In many ways, them doing that created a blessing where it's like, y'all are still doing those stale jobs. And we have e evolved because you ain't want us there, cool, we created our own lane. And so the number one thing that I had to implement was to not retaliate. Because that is maybe the hardest thing. When someone's saying something that's not true and you wanna go clear your name and say, they're lying, not participating. When someone's calling your name, not calling the name back when you know literally it seems like they're so much more powerful i gotta do something to you know fight for myself and the reality is all we did was lock in our, on our purpose and we're like our fight is going to be by way of how much effort and energy we put into our mission and so we tune them out and when i say they've been doing this madness they've been doing it for 10 years it hasn't stopped it hasn't gone anywhere it's the same negative, you know, aggression, quite frankly. And I just, I'm thankful that I never let it um, 
wear me down or make me someone I'm not, right? Or make me behave in ways that just aren't in alignment with who I am. We have a couple minutes left. Okay. And I have a, a question because I'm very inspired by everything you're saying so far. Thank you. Um, one question is, is there any, is there a dream that you still want to achieve? Yes. <laughs> You should see my vision board. When you come by <laughs> next, I'm going to show you my vision board. It's like a poster. Um, so we've, you know, our work has been seen by 100 million people online, right? And that's so... Congratulations. Thank you. Unreal. Because that's all self-produced work. We have a movie coming out starring Will Ferrell, Ryan Reynolds, Octavia Spencer this, this holiday season in November called Spirited. That's like massive dream. All the sync ladies are in it. Amazing. So now the next thing is we must become executive producers of content that features us as artists, as tap dancers on TV and in film. So right now it's amazing because I'm getting to choreograph these massive big projects, put all of us in it, boom. But I want to really tell our story. So that's the, that's the mode I'm in is we've had an amazing run. It's been fantastic. But the next frontier is that we are telling stories on these massive platforms um, that have never been shared before. My final question, which is always my favorite. Mm -hmm. If you could talk to your young self, if you could say something to young Chloe, as she's making the decision to go to college or at four or six or 12, it depends on which part of your life and what you were starting. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give young Chloe? Mm. I think that I would primarily just say to, to lean into the belief that it's possible and that everything is possible. I think that it can be so difficult when you're so little and the, the obstacles are so large, right? But I think just the daily reminder that it's possible and that just the you can do it the you know i think ultimately bottom line i always think about you know i think i was sharing when i pray i just pray to be alive i just pray for health and life and i want that for all everyone you know and then the rest of it i'm willing to work for and i think i would just remind my younger self that you can do it whatever it is like don't let fear override your personal faith Wow. I feel like you were speaking to me right there. <laughs> Keep believing. Yep. Believe that Harvard can be your safety net. Mm -hmm. And man, your story is so powerful. Thank you. I can't wait for you to come back. Actually, Adele. after the movie comes back, Woo! comes out. I can't wait for you to come back. <laughs> Hopefully you're not too big time for us. Ah, right never, <laughs> never that. But yo, this is, this is incredible. Thank, Thank you so you. much for sharing your story. Thank you, Festus. You inspire me. I really wanted to be on your podcast because I think your story is so powerful and your message and the whole entire movement, I'll call it a movement, is so uplifting and I feel like I'm a part of it. And when I wear your t-shirt to my sets, because I wear them to like sh shoot the movie, I wore it to... James Corden, when I'm choreographing, I wear it. And I love how people respond to it because everybody has something in them they're trying to rebuild. Jeez, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other way to end this. This is amazing. Thanks, Thank Estes. Thank that was fun. I, lear I love that I learned more about you. <laughs> we got to do this again. This I is know. amazing. Hey, Fest is here. I hope you liked that episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and here's some more episodes that you might like. Uh, I mean, on this side. <laughs>